one more second. Well, welcome to all of our Facebook friends today on Kitchen Conversations. I'm so excited to be here with Mary Taylor and John Borger from the Lake Stevens School Board. And Mary is, um, a, is the president of the school board, as well as a um, transitional specialist for Youth and Family Services. And John is the vice president of the Lake Stevens School Board, as well as a contact engineer for Expedia. So welcome to my kitchen. And I'd say cheers. I'd offer you coffee if you were here and you're not. Do you guys have anything? Yay! Everybody has a little something to drink at least. So welcome, welcome. And I've told folks a little bit about you, but I'm going to um, see if you want to share anything else before we get into some of the questions about education. Thanks. There you go first. All right. <laughs> Thanks, April. While it is true that John and I are both um, school board members in Lake Stevens, um, we've been around for a while, um, just want to um, offer a disclaimer that, of course, our participation here is because we think April is amazing and awesome and is, does not reflect the, um, we're not representing Lake Stevens School Board here, um, although we've had um, interactions with her through our school board. Um, school board duties and and have been really impressed and so really wanted to join her for these conversations thanks for having us thank you yep and i'll just echo echo what mary said they're super excited to be here and to participate and to be part of your uh, your movement april thank you so much and it feels like a movement it's the new normal <laughs> um one of the things i have to tell you right off the bat this has been the most popular topic i think so far for kitchen conversations um not just the fact of um that we're in COVID and we're in this time of crisis but education in general and so many things that education touches and so coming up with this topic of rethinking educational equity post-COVID has really sparked a lot of conversation. So I'm excited about diving right in um, and talking with you about some of the ways that we can start thinking differently about education um, after we're through this crisis. So I know one of the things um, that we're talking about are opportunities. We're in this great big challenge right now, but post-COVID, I think there are going to be some opportunities in education and in the education realm. Um, and if you guys want to talk about a few of those, and maybe we can just have a good conversation about what some of those opportunities will be. Awesome. Um, well, I'll jump in again, because John knows when to jump in and stop me, I think. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm really interested in talking about what education will look like post-COVID. And I also think that um, this moment in time is also a really important opportunity um, to think about what education looks like um, when we know that when we need to disrupt a system that is inherently inequitable and inherently challenging, we have to we have to create a disruption to change it, right? And so people protest and people um, have over um, <laughs> the history of our country worked really hard to change things by creating their own disruption. and. It's interesting to me that as, as traumatic and difficult and heart-wrenching this crisis has been for children and families in Washington and, and around the world, that um, in some ways, this is a disruption, this is a disruption that's been created sort of organically, um, that's upsetting a lot of systems and a lot of institutions um, and education being um, perhaps the most um, obvious just because uh, we're seeing the effects so dramatically. And so mm -hmm. the, the opportunity that I see really is thinking about relationships, that um, learning happens within relationships and we are forced at this moment in time to think about not just a child as a student and how we get them to standard, but think about that child in the context of her family and how we think about um, how to provide learning opportunities for that child with, um, a, with a, an approach that centers that child and her family. We can think about experiential learning. We can think about cultural assets as they relate to how that child is learning. Opportunities that are far beyond our limited scope when we have children sitting in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say that schools are not doing a great job engaging with families because many are. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity for us to um, to not get away from that, to not sort of skip that relationship-based family approach and really think mm -hmm. about a, a ch child and family strengths when we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about learning. And mm -hmm. I, I think that relationships first piece is absolutely critical and therefore an opportunity. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it sounds like the families we've been brought in, right? Like, so this is this, we had no choice but to jump in at the deep end um, and thinking about how that's going to work in the future, I think is huge. But John, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I think the other thing too is, is when we talk about these relationships and we talk about family relationships as well, but I think it gives us a, an opportunity both as <clears throat> parents of students who are in a classroom, but also as leaders in the educational community, whether you're an administrator or a board member or even a leader in the community. It's an opportunity for us to look at how can we better support our teachers as part of that relationship as well, because we know that there are teachers who in the midst of all this are teaching their classes, but may also be teaching students of their own and handling all kinds of other requirements. And it helps us to realize that there is quite a balance back and forth between parents and students and teachers as that, and I'm going to use Mary's term because I really believe it is, in that family. And how do we all support one another? And how do we support one another, not only during this time, but also going forward? We're trying new things. We're innovating in new ways. We're involving parents in ways that we've never had to involve parents before. We're also asking our teachers to do things that they've never done before. And we can take best practices as we go through this entire situation and come out the other side and say, like Mary said, this is our, our organic revolution. And we can say, what next? What do we do better? What can we take from this experience that we can take into the new normal and how do we make it better for all students and staff and families alike? Yeah, and that's huge. I think, um, I think I'm glad you mentioned the teachers because we don't wanna leave them out of this conversation in terms of what things look like, but I think engaging families more in the process is not mm -hmm. excluding teachers and the yep. value that they bring and the value that they bring to learning. So, so that's huge. I think that um, one thing is that, you know, that echoes through both of your statements is going back to the, the old way is probably is not the way to do it. Like we've got, we've got an opportunity to reset the table. And so taking advantage of it will be huge. And so one of the things that have come up with a lot of families is what is learning going to look like, like a blended classroom, a flipped classroom, what does that all entail? And so what are your takes on um, new ways of implementing education post COVID? I'm going to go first in this one, Mary, because you know I've got kind of a passion for some of these things, especially coming from my technology background. I do think the way in which we teach is going to change, and it's going to change differently whether we're talking a first grade classroom or a senior level class at the high school. Um, and how we make those changes is going to depend on what's best for students. But we talk about, as we're looking at how do we start to bring students back into the classroom, we're going to look at this blended of technology driven versus in class, you know, in class learning, because there are some requirements where we may take a class of 20 students and we may only teach 10 at a time and do 10 at a time in the morning and 10 at a time in the afternoon. Um, I think the other thing that we're going to look at is using the idea of the only way I can think to describe it is kind of a, a Montessori type approach where the teacher is there as a guide for the student and the student, and this works better at the higher grade levels, the students that have the ability to find the things that they are passionate about mm -hmm. and to go down that rabbit hole online and, and it kind of use the technology and the teacher as the catalyst for some self-directed student learning mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with the teacher then as that guide and that, that ability to provide what we commonly refer to as differentiated instruction to meet mm -hmm. the needs of the students specific to their learning. Um, but then it's not the old as we're used to teacher standing in front of a classroom delivering a lecture. There may be some more of that student led learning through it. Yeah. And that makes sense. The project base, the student led learning, that's all things I think we're going to see a lot more of um, after this. Mm -hmm. So I, I am, whenever uh, someone asks me what I think about what education is going to look like <laughs> as we're moving forward, I think it's going to look really different. Mm -hmm. And um, what I mean by different, uh, I mean that it could look really different in every community. It could look really different in every school. It could, um, we're facing challenges that are far beyond we can't have children in a classroom, right? Mm -hmm. we're, um, I have two teachers downstairs at my house right now and a 10-month-old and a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. And knowing that um, they are all in my social isolation circle. They're my children. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, yes, just, just so you know, be very, very safe. Um, but the reality is we were fortunate enough to be able to keep our isolation circle, um, to keep my grandkids in it, in that they, um, how, how would these teachers teach? How mm -hmm. are parents working? How are um, all of these things happening and trying to meet the needs of children at home? Um, there is an amazing, um, there was an amazing poem and I apologize. I, I just, it just popped into my head and I, I don't, can't even think of the author, but essentially that we're, we're all in the same boat, that we're mm -hmm. just not all in the same storm. And so when I think about all of these inspiring ideas around um, project-based learning and really thinking about how kids and families can be really inspired to take on, um, more self-directed learning. Um, I just cringe and struggle. Um, that I'm inspired by that. And yet I think about the disparities that have been magnified by this mm -hmm. crisis to a heartbreaking degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the death rates that are been just sh shockingly unconscionably higher for people mm -hmm. of color, um, even contracting COVID depending on your, um, status, your, your class, your income level and your zip code, your zip code and your color. Mm -hmm. um, all of these challenges, when I'm excited about experiential learning and I see my seven-year-old granddaughter um, getting really excited about learning and, and she's got some learning challenges. And so mm -hmm. when I see that she's able to engage in learning in a different way and it's a really positive thing, I get really excited. And then I think, and wow, how fortunate mm -hmm. she is that, mm -hmm. um, that those opportunities are there for her because if her mom and dad had to go out to work as essential workers, if they were in hospitals or a um, checker at a grocery store, that's not the same opportunity. And so that brings me back to, to think about how we mitigate some of those challenges and really mm -hmm. keep at the top of our mind that we need to be we need to really be thinking trauma-informed approaches. We need to yeah. be thinking about healing-centered practices. We need to be thinking about the child care crisis being a social mm -hmm. issue. Not, it's not just a problem for mm -hmm. families with young children, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. the idea that uh, somebody else's children not having child care doesn't affect me is absurd, right? Because 60%, yeah. I think, or something of workers in the United States have children have kids. Yeah. No, it affects us all. Yeah. <laughs> Might affect our yeah. working population. So exactly. when I, when I think about how all those things tie together, I, I just really think that the opportunity for, for whatever we can take moving forward and thinking about how we can innovate. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we also have to think about how to mitigate the effects of those, um, opportunities. If we're calling them opportunities, we need mm -hmm. to ensure that they are in fact opportunities and not further widening disparities between um, yeah. children in different communities. Absolutely. Well, and so I love the poem. You'll have to figure out who it's by because I think that is so accurate in today's environment that we really are all in the same boat, but it's not the same storm. And that's probably going to be this week's mantra for me. I always like cling I'll to a phrase. <laughs> yeah, that's I cling to a phrase each week of what kind of gets me through. Um, but that said, is is the inequities, like you said, were magnified by COVID, not created. Um, and it gets us to kind of that hierarchy of needs, right? So um, your district, just like my district, them um, and Everett, you have homeless kids. You've got a demographic that's changing. You've got disparities in, um, you know, in how folks are taught and how they learn and how when and how they graduate. Um, so as far as like equity, I guess, would you see any specific ways that um, that we could use this as an opportunity to um, to overcome some of those challenges and I think in our district, you know, it's really shown us the need for uh, broadband and Wi-Fi and things like that. And, and it seems like that, tr that follows that same trajectory of if you're students of color, you might not have as much access to those types of things. Um, but how does equity look in your district? Um, <laughs> we, our demographics in our school district are, um, it's a, um, it has, has historically been a pretty white, pretty homogenous community. Mm -hmm. It is, however, a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. And so it's really mm -hmm. difficult for people to see and recognize that it's not just, um, it's not just wealth and opportunity that exists here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting um, in our community, like many others, um, 
and John, sorry, I jumped right in. Feel free to nope. wait. You're good. Go for it. <laughs> that this is um, the, maybe the biggest opportunity um, to think about mitigating the effects of, um, of racism and all, all sorts of other challenges along um, over many, many years. As you said, they weren't created by this. But there's no opportunity to look away mm -hmm. at this point. There is no way you can assume that children mm -hmm. who are expected to learn from home, mm -hmm. that access to those technologies that will allow them to learn mm -hmm. couldn't, shouldn't be a basic right, right? Yeah. It, we, should, we should absolutely, there's just no way you cannot have access to like access to electricity was once yeah, considered a, exactly. a luxury. This is no mm -hmm. longer a luxury. And so I think that perhaps the opportunity more than anything else that this has created for us in our community and, mm -hmm. and communities around the state is to that, that there, it's not an option to look away. It's, it has yeah. just magnified some of the most glaring disparities in and then that's the heavy lifting of now you know you can't not know so you let's figure out know. what to do about this mm -hmm. that's a good point yeah. yeah well you just said it all mary i can't i can't even uh to jump on that you went ahead it's like, oh, you're that's right. it's like you hang out with me it's like we've been on the board <laughs> together for a long time we're sharing that high mind on some things well, and I think but to your point, and I know, John, you're passionate about technology. I think technology has a role to play in that. And so once we get the basics, the infrastructure piece met, and that could be an area where the legislature helps, um, is then what do we do with that technology, that new access that these folks have, and how can that enhance their education? And I think it, to, to build off that, though, April, I mean, I've, I've had a couple members of my community say to me, well, why can't we create a system like, and a lot of mm -hmm. folks have pointed to online learning folks such as um, WGU and things like that where the system is just there and why can't we flip the switch and get everybody onto a standardized system and there's two things I think that are at play in that one is to me that approach undervalues the touch and the relationships that students have with the teacher mm -hmm. and you cannot replace the teacher with an automated online learning system yeah. The other, the other thing is too is is that that assumes then that that one system is the will cover the needs of every student. And I know mm -hmm. from talking with people around the state, there are a lot of folks that use Google Classroom, and Google Classroom is an amazing tool, and mm -hmm. I'm fascinated and impressed by the tool that it is. But I can tell you, for a kindergartner or a first mm -hmm. grader. Google Classroom is a barrier to learning, in my yeah. opinion. And there mm -hmm. are other tools. Um, I've seen one being used called Seesaw. And I have mm -hmm. seen first graders on their own recording responses to prompts oh, left by their teachers mm -hmm. and leaving little notes and working with parents to upload little videos and audio and all that kind of stuff. And then it's almost like a running for lack of a better word, and to our folks on Facebook, it's almost like a running classroom Facebook page of oh. all of their work. And they can see it. The teachers can interact with them back and forth. And that to me says, okay, we're talking differentiated technology for differentiated instruction. And we need to, to take a very good look at that. But like Mary said, if we can't connect someone to the internet to get to those tools, yeah. it's a moot point. And so uh, we're getting to the point now where we absolutely have to you know, meet the needs of students. Mm -hmm. Where they are. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think that gets back to all those touch points, right? Family engagement and connectivity um, and, you know, the hierarchy of needs and much like electricity and sewer, now we've got broadband being that basic, basic need. Um, we do have a question from one of the folks that are joining us in our webinar. Um, they wanted to ask uh, what's being done about no child left behind when it comes to children of color, kind of I think to this equity piece that we're, we're talking about. And maybe if there's anything specific or, or general that you wanted to share from your district. Yeah, so, um, so uh, I'm gonna take, you can tell me if I'm um, interpreting this question incorrectly, but so, no Child Left Behind a couple years ago was replaced in 2011, I think, by a new law that um, that uh, created the Every, All, Every Student Succeeds Act um, mm -hmm. that replaced the sort of punitive effects of, of No Child Left Behind, which is um, the federal education law. Um, and at 
this point in time, we don't actually have to respond. I mean, we don't have the same kinds of challenges around responding to um, the uh, sort of punitive actions of that law. But one of the things that it did do, and I think you're pointing out here that um, as challenging as that law was, um, especially near the end, that it really pointed out the disparities that we were seeing for children of color and mm -hmm. children in um, communities that were um, marginalized for me uh, yeah. many reasons many and years. um and really forced uh, schools and school districts to sort of look at the impacts of education on um on children further from opportunity and and respond to that so um that was a really good thing there were mm -hmm. some punitive effects that came out of that that were not such a great thing um but the the new law as it's come into effect has provided opportunities for us to respond mm -hmm. um, in different ways and recognize those disparities and figure out how to resolve some of those challenges mm -hmm. i will say that um we don't have um we don't have great solutions to what we're um what if if what we're determining to be the case for children of color or children from any marginalized or, or underserved population um, is to have them do better on a test um, which is a lot of that has been a lot of the federal focus um, that's not the solution and again one of um, because we know that our, our tests are biased our, our um, for, for many reasons high stakes testing is not a great solution to try and support um, children's mm -hmm. learning and so um that's an opportunity that covid has created because we've mm -hmm. been um this is an opportunity to bypass those standardized tests and look at really um, other ways to think about children's learning that aren't um, measuring to a um to a standardized test um and don't create the same kind of high stakes environment and so we're more able to respond to children's individual needs so i hope that yeah. helped yeah and i think it does i think one thing um for and i in putting on my school board director hat um it's it's hard to teach to individual learners because we as educators haven't been tasked with that so we're taught you know people teach to the mass and i think one thing if there's any um, opportunity that comes out of this is looking more at that individual learner looking more at what can we do specifically for that kiddo who's not making progress um i've been really excited about the competency-based um, credit system in terms of looking at something beyond high stakes tests. So hopefully that can start filling the gap. But I think it's, to your point, Mary, we can't look away anymore. <laughs> and so this is, this is gonna be, we're gonna have to figure out solutions. Well, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out too, cause I noticed, notice and, and, and I'm gonna thank Joyce uh, particularly for, um, uh, mm -hmm. for asking some of the questions. I think the reason that we don't yet have a solution yet is because we're still in communication with those communities that have not been, um, maybe been a part of the discussion and we're trying to come up with a solution as best as possible that meets as many of the needs as possible. And the truth is, is that as we all know, as lifelong learners, we can try things and it may not get us exactly where we need to be. And it takes time to make mistakes and learn from them and continue mm -hmm. to grow. And I think what you'll find is, especially when you, when we ask specifically about Lake Stevens, the community itself has changed um, and we are changing with it, but because it's a, it's a little bit of a moving target. And so we continue to strive to meet the needs of all of these students. We continue to strive to find the students who may not, who may not have had their needs met in the past, and we will continue to do so. But we continue to find pockets and new opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was one of the problems I had with No Child Left Behind a long time ago is, the 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 target was always moving and so we could yeah. never say we're going to get everybody to 100 percent because the target would move mm -hmm. and so we will continue to we won't rest on our laurels um mm -hmm. we won't continue to say well you know we'll get to 95 percent of mm -hmm. this we're going to continue to strive to 100 learn mm -hmm. from where we fell short and continue and, you know and, and continue to grow and learn right alongside the students that we're teaching mm -hmm. and that's and i think 
that that is something that's healthy, it's doable. And I think to your point, engaging the communities that are specifically affected is huge because you mm-hmm. have to talk with folks in that community about what are the needs and what are the disparities and where are the gaps. Um, I think from for me putting on a candidate hat, you know, I want to see the legislature do more in terms of um, some of education priorities and guidance for districts in terms of ethnic studies and different things like that that could engage kids on a different level about different themes. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's a hard, all of our districts, um, having come from Edmonds, being in Everett, I can see it every day and the disparities are there, they're glaring, and we have to figure out solutions. There's a... Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go first on this one, Mary. There's a there's a speaker that Mary and I have heard at a couple of of school board conferences, and um, I remember a story very clearly that he tells. And for a long time, he was a critic of the public education system in America, and he kept saying we should run this like a business, and and that was kind of the thought I think behind a lot of No Child Left Behind. And he kept saying we're gonna do this, and this is the way we're gonna do, it, and we're gonna run it like a business because that's where we're gonna find the most efficiencies. And he ran an ice cream company, and a teacher stood up and asked him and said, okay, and I don't remember the gentleman's name and Mary might be able to pull it out, but I don't remember, but she said to him, sir, if you get an order of marshmallows for your Rocky Road ice cream Mm -hmm. and the marshmallows are bad, what do you do with them? And he says, well, we send them back. And she said, that's the difference. We can't send the bad marshmallows back. We are responsible for taking what is given to us and educating everyone. And he said that was an aha moment for him that we can't just run this like a business and we must mm-hmm. always be learning and adapting to the children that we receive that come mm-hmm. through the doors and the situations in which we're given. And that to me is public education in a nutshell is we welcome all everybody, including the folks that may not come in and be the best that they want to. I have a friend who teaches in Eastern Washington and of the 18 kids in her classroom, six of them have behavioral issues that at times can stop the entire classroom cold students that will throw things or will yell or will hit but Mm -hmm. she's still responsible for all of them and to help them to teach them and to help them to grow in grade standard because that's what she's asked to do and she does it to the best of her ability and parents specifically ask for her because of the growth she may have done with older students as they go Mm -hmm. so we have to remember that we're learning alongside everyone Mm -hmm. and it's it's we're all in this together it's that community together yeah and that's and that's huge and i think that we're going to have to continue to work on solutions um and i think that you know absolutely trying to get kiddos ready for where they need to be is huge um, we have another question um, from a grandparent, um, and we might run like a couple minutes over, and hopefully that's okay to our Facebook friends and folks on webinar. But um, so it says I'm a grandparent, so I'm not affected directly by online learning, but would think the majority of kids that are learning this way through our new situation will be behind at various levels when schools open again. Um, is there anything in place for these deficiencies in learning? That's a great question. <laughs> I know we've all been struggling question. with that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to address that. Um, the The answer to that is, um, Ms. Rhodes, that we will be um, meeting children and families where they are. There is no other option. Well, I, um, the notion of deciding that someone is behind when we've had to abandon everything we've known about education for three months or six months or nine months or however long it's going to be, Mm-hmm. and that we're going to be calling that um, behind uh, is, is absurd. We absolutely, we need to be thinking about where, where every child is, where families are, what the opportunities are, and how we differentiate and build on their learning. Um, it is a huge lift. It's huge to ask for our teachers and administrators and schools, and there's no other option. The idea that we're going to teach a curriculum and mm-hmm. and people are going to have to just figure out where they fit in is yeah. sadly how our system was built, but not what we want out of our system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I mean, when I, when I'm thinking, if we circle back to the argument about what are we what are we doing for disparities for underserved children, and and we know the things that we can do. We need to hire more culturally diverse staff. We need to hire more teachers of color. We need to utilize curriculums like since time immemorial. We have 
Um, we need to diversify our elected officials, our school boards. We need to think yeah. about people making decisions and engage communities that have been underserved and that have mm -hmm. been furthest from opportunity in order to figure out how to do this. And, and those same levels of engagement are gonna be absolutely necessary to um, provide opportunities for children's learning regardless of where they are when they come back in our door or when they come back into whatever this new model looks like. Yeah, that's and huge. I, yeah. I think the follow on to it is a discussion too that needs to happen at the state level. And Ms. Rhodes, thank you for the question. I think too, we've suspended our statewide standardized test for this year because mm -hmm. of the situation we're in. And quite frankly, my personal opinion is that we need to look at suspending it for not just this year, but next year and maybe the year following as we start to close this gap, because I think yeah. we would be doing all of our students a disservice mm -hmm. if we hold them accountable to the same standards going from second to third grade, for example, when really they came in with half of second grade and then we're expecting that educator to educator not only to get them to where they should have been when they walked in the door at mm -hmm. third grade ideally but also get them to where they needed to be at the end of third grade and so i think there will be some time for catch up and we can hold students and assess them and their accountability as part of it but i don't think that statewide standardized test is really going to be appropriate and give us an appropriate and accurate measurement of our schools and our students for a year or two after we're all out of this yeah, I that's I think both of you hit the nail on the head with that. And I think um, Mary, just that that thought of we're not going to look at kiddos as being behind. We're not going to, you know, artificially say you're behind when you never were able to get on track or ahead. So, um, you know, we're going to meet all the kids where they are and help them get to where they need to be. And I think looking at learning for learning sake, not for this metric, or to your point, John, this test that you have to do well in this test, it's no, it's you've got to be a lifelong learner. Um, so that's, that's huge. Oh my word, there is so much to unpack when it comes to education on an absolutely normal day. If this was just, if we weren't in crisis, we could still talk for hours about education, where it is and where it should go. But needless to say, this crisis, it's given us a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities, and a lot of ways that we can start thinking about things differently um, and making it equitable for all our kiddos across the state. So I can't thank you enough for having this conversation. Um, and I think like I told you guys last week, this is the start of a conversation. I did put part one on this <laughs> because I knew it was gonna be exciting. Um, of course, timely, but folks have a lot of questions. Um, so hopefully um, this is part one and we'll be able to have you back in my kitchen maybe in a month or so so that we can talk about part two, which is maybe where we are at that point and what it's looking like for the fall. Um, so yeah, so I guess any closing words before we sign off and, and, and refill our coffee cups? <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. So April, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank everybody for your questions and your passion because passion for public education is what makes it as strong as it is right now and will continue to benefit our students from now, but not only uh, in the future. I think if there's anything that I take, and if you want another uh, you know, kind of phrase to hang on your board, April, is mm -hmm. I go back to Fred Rogers. And Fred Rogers said, anything that is manageable is mentionable and anything that is mentionable is manageable. The fact that we are here having this conversation mm -hmm. tells us that we can take care of this. We can handle it. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but mm -hmm. we can work together as a community for our kids and with our kids. We need to make sure that their voice is heard on this mm -hmm. to figure out how to come out of this and be even stronger than we were when we went into it. That's awesome. Thank you. And Mary, any last words? Uh, just thanks so much for this opportunity. I'm thrilled Great. that you're generating these conversations. I think how we do this is together. And, uh, and I think this is just a great example of how to keep our arms around each other in order to move forward. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your time. Thank you for those quick, great words that I can hang um, as my mantras because I do, um, in these challenging times, I do cling to words. Um, so thank you so much. They're powerful. Have a great rest of your day and all of our friends on Facebook and of course in our webinar. Hopefully we'll see you right back here next Wednesday or sorry, next Tuesday, <laughs> oh my word, at 3 p.m. Uh, for Kitchen Conversations. We're going to be talking about small business and specifically small businesses in Snohomish. So hopefully you can join us for a great conversation with Sarah Jensen and City Councilwoman Linda Redmond from uh, the city of Snohomish. So thank you all and have a fabulous week. Bye-bye.
Thanks, everybody. Amazing. Bye. Bye-bye.